I'm Nancy Littlejohn with Nancy Littlejohn Fine Art in Houston, Texas. Welcome. We're here today with the artist Sarah Carter and we're going to ask her a few questions and learn a little bit more about her practice. So Sarah is has lived in Houston before. She's originally from here, but she has been living and working in the Bay Area for about 25 years and she just moved back to Austin about a year or so ago. We have a very good mutual friend who reached out to me immediately and told me that she was gonna be back in uh, Texas and said, you have to work with Sarah. And I'm so glad that I reached out because this is the product of what we've been working on for the past couple of years. So this is Sarah's first solo show with the gallery and we just want to ask her a few questions about her practice and, and what she's up to. So um, I'm just going to jump into the first question. So Sarah, this show is called Lit With Color. And previously you've spoken about how a viewer's experiences are affected by their relationship with color. Do you want to talk to us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I think that that people have a, a, an emotional response to color and they may or may not be aware of it, but it certainly, no pun intended, will color their experience uh, in, sure. the, in the world. They can be repelled, they can gravitate toward, uh, they can have, um, I guess, epiphanies regarding aspects of their life that they may or may not be aware that, that the color is stimulating, but there's a vibration uh, to, to color, and it is a frequency that is, that is present with your own frequency, and there is a cause and effect that will trickle into your, your conscious mind, your experience, and um, whether it's known or not, yes. So um, is there a reason why you've chosen the black and white as the centerfolds in the center? Yes, well, there's, it's, there are, it's multifaceted, uh, okay. the choice. Uh, one would be my aesthetic preference, that, that, that the contrast uh, is, is not only beautiful, but it's very anchoring mm -hmm. of, of that which is vibrating. Um, I believe, well, oftentimes when I am drawn to painting with uh, the, the vibrancy of color, I can cover an entire canvas with that color as my own experience of the color. But I often realize that when the entire canvas is covered with that, the, the experience that I was going for mm -hmm. is, is muted. I feel that when you when you back out of that mm -hmm. and allow just a peak of it, a bit of it, okay. that the power of that color is so much more prevalent. So I'm going to back up a little bit because I know that um, you have a, a personal way of coming about some of these colors. Do you find in your work that people are more drawn to the red or the green or some of the beautiful blues that you use and do people tell you about their responses? Do people say, wow, that red makes me feel like X and are those responses uh, predictable? Or do you hear things that you have just never even heard of before? You know, I'm, I, one has, one rarely ever says why it is that they're gravitating toward a okay. color for me. Okay. Uh, but I do, of course, hear people say, oh my gosh, blue and green. Mm -hmm. or, I, or I hear for this particular piece, I've had many people uh, look through the whole body of the work, uh, complimenting everything, and then settling on this piece. Right. Um, others have settled on this piece, and then others have settled on, on some of the smaller pieces in the back. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, I, I think it is so very subjective, um, but there's definitely, the, the effect that I am hoping for is, is happening even if they are not explaining it. Okay, that makes sense. 
So I know for myself personally, whenever we get a new body of work in the gallery, I like to just spend time with the work. And so after we did this installation, I tell Emily, I'm just gonna walk into the gallery because I need to spend more time with the work. And I've done that exact same thing. I kind of float around to each one and discover something new in each one, even if it's just the most minute little thing or something as broad and um, obvious as maybe this particular color. Mm -hmm. So what do you feel like you are offering through your work? Oh my goodness. Um, I, I believe the, word, the work offers so many things and I think that, that much of what it can offer are things that I haven't even thought of. I think it's quite subjective to the viewer. Um, one could in their surface mind just think that they're gravitating toward a piece because all they can come up with is that it's pretty and, and that is valid mm -hmm. and that is good enough. Mm -hmm. um, we are drawn to what we subjectively think of and define as beauty. And I work with that from my own subjective perspective, but I also use that as a catalyst for what, what I'm wanting to express in my work. Because I think if people are drawn in um, by something that, 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 they're, that they gravitate to, they're, gonna, they're going to be there. They're going to uh, stand in front of the particular piece. And when you're in the vicinity, you, the vibration of you, mm -hmm. you are standing within the vibration of, of this field. Right. And there, there is an exchange going on. Um, and that is what I'm drawn to offer. That is what I hope occurs. Um, I think of it as a service as opposed to this is what I know how to do. Right, right. So it's an offering, really. Mm -hmm. I love that you put it in within the context of a service and an offering. And I can tell you that um, the response that we've been getting to the work, even um, during these times, people do come in, but a lot of people, of course, look at the work online, and they are commenting on the vibration of the gallery and the feel of the gallery. And I don't know for our viewers, if most people know, but before this was Nancy Littlejohn Fine Art, it was a Buddhist community center for 10 years. So we feel like it has a vibration that resonates, and to have Sarah's work in with its very distinguished um, vibration on top of that, we kind of feel like we're hitting on all cylinders right now. Yes. A and people are feeling it, and considering everything that's happening in the world, and there's so much pain right now, this gallery space is vibrating at a higher frequency because of your work and because of the building itself. So we feel like it's pretty special right now. And that, um, as a gallery, we feel like it's our offering as well. Wonderful. Just a thought. So um, we've talked about the black and white. We've talked about your making an offering. And so let's talk about just maybe the size of the work. And does that have any relevance to the feeling of the colors that are stirred here? Um, I mean, the little ones are pretty powerful too, right? They are. I, I, I don't know that, that this particular body of work that I chose the size so that they would do what they do okay. so much as I knew that the size would be a contributing factor to what they offered, um, if that makes any sense. For me, in my um, desire and my attempt to live what I was painting, I wanted them to be larger than life, mm -hmm. uh, if not monolithic in, right. in some sense. So there is the drama of, of the large canvas that cannot be escaped regardless of what is on it. Mm -hmm. There is the jewel-like intimacy of a smaller cam canvas. Um, and I would say that in some senses, you could take any of the compositions that I've done here and switch them out large to small. Mm -hmm. And while they would look different, they would still, ha they would still be effective. 
Right. So there isn't a sense that these were large because they could only be large. Okay. Those are small because they could only be small. Okay. So people are caught a little bit off guard because these works are monumental in scale. Um, and then they're on the vertical. So of course, as a human being, we meet that vertical very naturally. Yes. Right. And then they walk around the corner and then they see these smaller works that are equally powerful and just like little jewels. And I have to say, I've really enjoyed <coughs> seeing people kind of move from this room to the next room. And I think you planned that yes. for the space. Thank you, yes. I'm glad you mentioned the vertical because that, if there was any planned um, orchestration of how it is that I thought I might invite people to to view and commune with the work it definitely was the vertical, the vertical. because yeah. I, I think that that is um, I don't want to say monastic but that's what's coming to my mind mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it there is a powerful uh, presence with the vertical um, as opposed to much in my life if I'm doing large pieces especially if they are not square mm -hmm. I will pretty much automatically choose the horizontal mm -hmm. so that you don't just have this linear rise yeah so that you have something that's that's broader right a little more expansive yes where for, for these pieces well I do think that they are successful as being broad with, with the break the small sort of um, quieted horizon break line mm -hmm. in, in the dark, the presence of them is, is vertical. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love that. Um, okay. So do you experience your own work differently in different <clears throat> settings? Um, be it your studio or a gallery or in a private collection? What sort of emotional attachment do you have? Yes. Um, the first thing that came to my mind as you were asking that question, and perhaps this is uh, coming from not necessarily a female, but from a mother, mm -hmm. it is the the child is the child, right? Wow. But you've you've put them in a particular outfit for a particular reason mm -hmm. to take them to an event, right? Right. And they are at the event, and everything is unfolding as you wanted it to be, right? Um, the, 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 the energy of the piece is no different in my studio than it is in here, but it's formalized in yeah, here. Definitely, definitely. So I think one of the most beautiful things about a solo exhibition is that this is the only time you will ever see this body of work as it was intended to be because after this, it has its own life. Yes. And, and every piece will move on to a, a collection or a museum or wherever it is. So to me, this is the purest form of ever viewing the work. Agreed, okay. yes. Okay. So um, do you wanna talk about your starting process, how you start a painting? Sure, um, I think that, that the, the most fundamental springboard is so organic that it's 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 I'm hardly able to describe it. Right. It's almost as though it comes to me, um, and I become a, the medium. Okay. In order to articulate it, but I will I will just I will get a, a download. I'll get an idea, uh -huh. and then I will start playing with it, either on paper or on my computer or in my head uh -huh. um, and I, I can sit for hours and just compose and articulate the composition until something resonates uh -huh. and then that is my starting point. Okay. Uh, rarely do the pieces ever materialize as this exacting thing. Uh -huh. I would say out of most of my series that I've done in the past two decades, this show is is as close to that which revealed itself to me as any of them have ever been. Okay. And wow. and I don't really know what that's about or what to think of it. Mm -hmm. In in some semblance, someone could say, well, then you know, you you painted by the numbers and you were controlling of it. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think that that's the case. Others could say, well, maybe it's just because you got a clearer vision right. of that which was wanting to come through you. Mm -hmm. So I tend to think it's the latter. Okay. Um, yeah, so starting point is, is in my head. Okay. Yeah. And then what about the colors? Colors, oh my goodness. Um, I find that I am drawn cyclically mm -hmm. to color combinations. Okay. Um, you might remember uh, some of the, the canvases of my, uh, the Ark of Maud. Mm -hmm. Lots of blue, mm -hmm. lots of green col color combinations. Right. So that, you know, is right here in, in this one. Right. And you can find it in, in many of the others. Um, I think classically, I've always been drawn to red and orange. Okay. So that's going to be an aspect of it as well. Um, and then I'm always drawn to the power of, of sort of the expected red, white, and blue, mm -hmm. because I think that the, that the power of that can, it's, people aren't trying to figure out those color combinations. We all right. know that color combination. That's amazing. Right. And so the power of that doesn't have to be loud while the painting is pretty intense mm -hmm. and is pretty loud. Right. But it doesn't have to be because of the colors that I've chosen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because I know a lot of artists, they just simply fall in love with certain colors. Like you'll talk to some and they'll say, I just love the way that particular green comes out of the tube, right? I, I do fall in love with colors. Yeah. But, yeah. but they, it does, you know, I will go, I will go cyclically uh -huh. with, with that. Okay. And I liked your comment about the red, white, and blue because you're presenting it so unconventionally, it doesn't even read as a red, white, and blue canvas. Yes. Right? Amazing. Okay, so um, this is about just the work and the process um, because this is so labor intensive. How do you enjoy painting? I mean, do you like to be in solitude? Do you enjoy listening to music? Do you kind of both cloister yourself? Do you like people in your studio? How do you do that? I, well, I have always worked alone. Okay. Um, right now, Ralph and I are sharing a studio. It's enormous. Okay. Um, and he is, since we have shared, and we shared for a little bit while we were in California when mm -hmm. he was in transition from one studio to the other. And at first I was like, oh, okay, you know, this is going to be temporary. And I kept waiting for the aspect of us that is a couple right. and that is social to sort of accidentally find itself in the studio and it did not amazing he he without saying I'm going to be very disciplined and and not even look at you okay I look over and he just it's as though I'm not there amazing which allows me to treat his presence as though it is not there wow. so in essence I am alone mm -hmm doing my work as I've always been, even okay. though he may or may not be there. Okay. Um, as far as the music goes, I can go through periods of where I need absolute silence. Mm -hmm. I can go through periods of where I want something really loud and with a lot of, of beat to it. Okay. And I can even, you know, dance in between what it is that I'm doing sure. with the canvases. But other times it's just, it's quiet. Mm -hmm. um, there can also be just the melodic music that, it, that, has, that has no singing, mm -hmm. that is just more mood music right. as well. Right, so um, most artists, I don't think a lot of people realize the level of discipline that it takes to produce a body of work. So do you wanna share with us what your usual day looks like? Do you get up in the morning and paint first? Do you like to have your chai in the morning? Or how do you kind of prepare for your day? Well, I, I have to say that, that my, my habit and routine in Austin is quite different than the 25 years of, of habit in the Bay Area because okay. my, uh, before Eloise was born, my studio was in San Francisco. 
but I had the leisure of, of not being a parent. So right, I, right. it was fine for me to drive the 25 miles to my studio. Okay. Uh, once she was on the planet, that was not gonna work. And I found an amazing studio, which I kept for over 17 years, yeah. and it was a mile and a half from my house. Amazing. So coming and going as a parent mm -hmm. um, was key. So I would drop her off at, at school, and mm -hmm. I would go immediately to my studio. Okay. So mornings then, yeah. but here, my studio is is it's a great place once you get there, but it's way too far away from my home. Okay. I think I think one day we will change that. Okay. Um, so I do my morning stuff at home, and then I go to the studio, and it will be anywhere from eleven in the morning till till two that is my starting time okay there was a period of time where when Eloise was in college and it was just me and Ralph we would have our entire day at home doing what we needed to do have an early dinner and then go to the studio sure. and work till 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning yeah yeah and then just sleep late okay um, that works logistically really, really well, but I don't know that I like it. Mm -hmm. um, I think I prefer the daytime, but my studio has no, it's an industrial space, mm -hmm. no windows, and I kind of don't like being there during the day when you don't know is it day or night outside. Right. So I haven't quite found uh, my pace in terms of what is my favorite yet. Okay, all right. So looking at the work, I wonder about your inspirations. I mean, Colorfield, Abex. Um, do you want to tell us about some of your favorite artists or influences? Sure. I would say that 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 abstract expressionism as well as Colorfield, absolutely. Mm -hmm. For me, they cross over. Yeah, me too. Um, and I would say that that those are the two fields that have influenced me the most, mm -hmm. and perhaps that's even obvious from looking back over all of my work. Uh, Bryce Martin was one of a, a wonderful curiosity for me mm -hmm. in the beginning, not understanding why is this so compelling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then learning more about that as, as a student and as just looking at art and understanding why it was what it was and all the way to Cy Twomley, which yeah. it could not be further from Bryce Martin. Mm -hmm. They are of equal influence to me. Obviously Rothko right. uh, is a great influence. De Kooning, great influence. Um, Lee Krasner. I was wondering. Fra Frankenthaler. I was wondering, yes. And, yes. and um, uh, Mitchell is, yeah. is a wonderful influence. Right. So I would say that, that while my, my compositions are not like any of theirs, I mean, they are mine, they, right. that the idea of, of sort of fleshing out the love of, of my own process mm -hmm. definitely echoes what I've studied from them. Right, well, you clearly have taken the baton and now it's your uh, true authentic voice with that thing that has inspired you. Um, and I love the fact that what you do is really about pure emotion. I mean, Abex and Colorfield, it's all about yes. evoking the emotion, and this is your interpretation of that. Yes. I just love it so much. Thank you. So do you guys, those are all sort of the formal questions that I have, but do you all have any questions that you would like to ask? Okay, Emily does. Sarah, can you talk about the choice of using linen as your canvas? Yes. And have you always used linen? I, I have not always used it. I, I used it a little bit uh, at the end of uh, being a student at the San Francisco Art Institute as an experiment. What is it like to paint on canvas? Um, I mean, I'm sorry, linen. I went back to Canvas because it just was, it was easier and more practical at the time. My switch to linen in this instance is for years I've been painting on unprimed uh, duck canvas, um, which I, I really loved the way the canvas would soak up the medium. And from a practical standpoint, it would take forever to get 
the canvas saturated enough to where you can then start making the composition. And I also noticed that when I wanted to paint thin, painting on unprimed canvas didn't really work all that well. And if I'm wanting the weave of, of the substrate to show, the linen weave is so much more beautiful than cotton duck in my mind. And these are primed as opposed to the unprimed, which allows me to have the thinner coats, which are very strategic in, in this body of work in that I'm conveying something that's sort of hovering and light um, as opposed to heavy and dense, mm -hmm. which also speaks to why I have quite deliberately left the sides raw because it allows it to be this, this thing that is light as opposed to painted, keeping it heavy. And secondly, I'm just curious about, more about your process. Are you always working on a body or is this, is this a, a birth and then, then you need a, a period of rest and a, a, re, a rebirth to create a new series? I, after a series, I do take a break uh, from, from creating the next series. Um, for years, when I was younger, I would create a body of work that took about a year or maybe a little less. And once I had the show, I found that I just kept painting in that same genre. It would just keep going until there was sort of a shift for the next body. But that doesn't seem to be the way that I'm doing it now. I just it's like once I painted number 15, I was like, okay, I need to just sit back and let it all sort of seep in. Good. Thank Anyone you. Else? I'm sure. Quick question. Um, how particular are you with choosing the shades of, say, blue, red? Um, yeah. The shades? Um, I am, I am very particular about that. Um, even if it is subtle, there is, for here, which is not particularly subtle, but this was quite deliberate that these two reds are completely different. Um, and they are placed such that the, the two centerfolds would bounce off more effectively as far as, you know, in, in my opinion. And the particular blues that I might choose, um, you know, I have a certain feeling that I'm going for, and I am basically just sort of told by the ethers that you're going to accomplish that with, you know, with this blue or with this combination. Um, on this painting here, you see the greens as an example. Um, they're both the phthalo green, and one of them is a blue tint, the bottom one the top is a green tint, and I knew that they would read sort of as one thing, but then when they hit is where you would, you would be able to see that they were something different. And this was my jumping off point for the large pieces, okay. which all the others followed from, from that in terms of how they were composed. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess this is just from like my point of view. I, uh, I find it impressive how much you can find such soft colors. And uh, I was wondering, like, for example, like how black reacts different with different uh, the colors of the such. So I was just wondering, I guess, at what point in your process do you look at your paintings and go, okay, this is enough, this is a complete plot for me. Uh, what, what point, at what point do you say, okay, I'm gonna keep this black and white straight, and I'm gonna make, uh, and I'm gonna keep the others like very green. Um, very good question. Um, I might have in my mind what it is that I think I'm going to do with a particular quality of a line. Um, and in the process of, of attaining that, I might see that now is the stopping spot just before I get there because the organic edge is, is so much more interesting and richer 
than any sort of precision that I might have been going for. And I, I do a play constantly in most of my bodies of work of a play on formality and informality of, of organic lines versus something that's very linear. I find that very rich. It holds a lot of, um, I'll say, positive tension that is interesting and draws a viewer in. Great question. Anyone else? Um, well, I, I will I will use the paper pieces that I've been doing most recently uh, as a way of answering that, which which may not be consistent across the board for all the paper versus the canvas. But I I really do believe that all of the paperwork that I've been doing while we've all been sheltering in place um, has been a placeholder for the work that I was then doing in the studio. Because these, these were happen, happening simultaneously. Um, I did do paper studies with this compositional genre to figure out, is this really how I want mm -hmm. to have this unfold? Um, which I think is quite obvious. And then once I started this series, I stopped doing those particular paper pieces for that reason, which were very deliberately studies. Okay. But as I continued doing all the really small paper pieces, this just kept showing up. This is all I was doing. I was doing it at home. I was doing it in the studio. Okay. So they completely relate. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. We have loved this. Well, I love being here. I'm so glad. Thank you so much. Okay.